Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Uh, happy Tuesday uh, to you and yours. Happy day after Monday. Happy day before hump day. Uh, awesome, awesome Tuesday show planned for you. Uh, it's awesome because Shamika Michelle is back with us. Uh, Shamika, uh, welcome back. Thanks for having awesome me. Awesome to have you here. You, you, always, you just brighten up the things and make things look and feel better around here. You're, you're actually, you know, we've moved you from the left to the right. We've moved you to the infamous spot, uh, Uncle Jimmy's former chair. Uh, are, are you ready for that uh, assignment? I'm ready. When I was here before, I put a little hoodoo voodoo on the seat, so <laughs> I knew I'd be back. Hoodoo voodoo. That sounds like you're taking credit for Uncle Jimmy out pursuing other opportunities. <laughs> Man, that ain't right. We got to stop before I get in any more trouble. All right. Uh, Steve Kim is going to be here. The Korean Cosell, as will Royce White, uh, is going to be here. And Larry Taunton. Uh, you guys remember Larry Taunton. Larry's been on the show before, but he wrote a very interesting thread over Twitter about uh, gun violence and mass killings. And so Larry's down in South America, but he's agreed to come on our show and, and we'll have a little talk and let him provide some information, some research from his years of world travel and that perspective on mass killings and mass shootings. Uh, so look forward to that toward the end of the show, but uh, we're gonna start where I always love to start and that's with a fire and a fire starter. Uh, so let's get this Tuesday rolling. Uh, historians will lament social media spread of the blocked and charged contagion. Its unprecedented negative impact on human engagement threatens democracies, freedom, and the truth. Blocked and charged is at the root of most of the alleged social contagions, existential threats, and pandemics corporate media rely on for ratings and relevance. Blocked and Charged has been around since the beginning of time. Its origins date back to the first time a young child stuck index fingers in its ears, closed its eyes, and shouted at the top of his lungs to avoid acknowledging an upsetting idea, opinion, or piece of information. Social media developers normalize the behavior for adults. Twitter and other social media apps trained influencers to block dissenting views and then charge their dissenters with racism, homophobia, homophobia, misogyny, and or transphobia. Yesterday, ESPN opinionist Sarah Spain uh, executed the blocked and charged concept to perfection. Troubled by a harmful or by a handful of Tampa Rays baseball players refusing to wear gay pride patches on their uniforms on religious grounds, Spain took to the around the horn airwaves to charge the players with bigotry. Take a listen for yourself. Pride is about inclusion, so you don't love them and you don't welcome them if you're not willing to wear the patch. And calling it a lifestyle reveals to me that you've done not even a modicum of research or understanding on this topic. It's what tends to happen when a privileged class isn't affected by things. This is not just about baseball. That religious exemption BS, which is used in sport and otherwise, also allows for people to be denied health care, jobs, apartments, children, prescriptions, all sorts of rights. And so we have to stop tiptoeing around it because we're trying to protect people who are trying to be bigoted from asking for them to be exempt from it when the very people that they are bigoted against are suffering the consequences. When you say trying to be bigoted. They're trying to use religious exemptions to affect the opportunities, services, uh, uh, available resources for people who are LGBTQ+. And a patch on the jersey in, in this way? In the case of sport, no. In the case of sport, though, they're double talking if they're saying you're welcome while also saying that we don't encourage or, or we disagree with it, especially when there are devout people of every single religion that also welcome and are open to people who are born gay. David. <sighs> I got to give Tony Reale credit. He, he made it through that word salad and asked the appropriate question like, hold on, a patch on a uniform does all of what it, you said in that word salad? My God. But, you know, I believe what Spain is actually saying is that Tampa pitchers, Jason Adam, Jalen Beeks, Brooks Raley, Jeffrey Springs, and Ryan Thompson are using their religious faith 
to express bigotry. After charging the players with bigotry on TV, Spain took to Twitter to clarify her position, tweeting, quote, using your religion as a shield for ignorance and bigotry is antiquated, and it's a choice. It's a choice made of privilege. You're not affected by the policies and laws that discriminate. You're not endangered by the hatred that bubbles. She then, based on the replies of several of her dissenters, began the process of blocking people who disagreed with her anti-religion screeds. Blocked and charged. It even I got a funny story. It even happened to one of our producers here, uh, David Reed. He, he tweeted at Sarah Spain, you know, she put out something about how uh, the Bible's antiquated and it isn't up to date with modern loving relationships. And Dave was like, no, 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 no. Modern, modern loving relationships aren't up to speed with the Bible. And immediately, within minutes, she blocked David from her Twitter feed. My God. Uh, listen, blocked and charged is the preferred tactic of corporate media. It's the nuclear option from mute and dispute. The negative impact on American culture cannot be denied. Social media has trained us to avoid engagement with people we disagree with and to never settle an argument. Block, charge, and move on. The Daily Wire's Matt Walsh produced a provocative, thoughtful, and entertaining documentary on the transgender issue. Most of the leg legacy media are refusing to review the doc or interview Walsh. The Daily Wire published a story about the vitriolic rejection emails it has received from movie critics. Here's an example of one. Hard effing pass, I won't give that transphobic bigot a platform on my site. Never email me again. Blocked and charged. That's what everyone's doing. This is a social media contagion that has polluted our entire society for years. I don't have one, I didn't have one friend who cared that I was politically agnostic and that my worldview was biblically conservative. I've never voted, no one cared. But in recent years, I've lost numerous friends because I don't hate Trump or his supporters. I don't hate Obama or his supporters. I don't like policies and customs that contradict my biblically conservative worldview. I don't even hate Joe Biden. I don't like the policies, the high gas prices, the inflation, the demonization of working class Trump supporters, the condescending attitude toward black people, the persecution of January 6th protesters. Years ago, before social media trained adults to act like children, I was a frequent guest on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News. My biblical worldview wasn't controversial and dangerous. I was friends and coworkers with atheists. Blocked and charged, uh, interpreted, lifelong, interrupted lifelong friendships. CNN and MSNBC view me as problematic and will never have me on their air again. I don't even vote. The politician I criticized the most and most viciously was Sarah Palin, a Republican, the right wing AOC. I've been blocked and charged by the left. This isn't a personal whine. I've never sought the approval of the mainstream establishment. I'm whining because the blocked and charged contagion is destroying America. It's dividing us. We no longer exchange ideas. We're locked in silos constructed by the social media matrix. As long as that's the case, our destruction is inevitable. Big tech. They're responsible for killing America. Mm. All right, that's my fire. What do you think of my fire, Shamika? I totally agree. I'm, I'm a little bit angry today, so I'm just waiting for you to give me the go ahead. Uh-oh, on this or something else? All of it. I'm a little bit upset that we even have to define what a woman is, and also because I may have to agree with you from yesterday. So <laughs> I, I get it. <laughs> People don't like agreeing with me. Steve Kim, the Korean Cosell. Uh, let's bring uh, Steve into the conversation. Uh, Steve, 
Uh, Sarah Spain is calling the Tampa Ray players bigots because mm -hmm. their religious beliefs make them not want to put on a gay pride patch. I, I, I just, I just don't. That if if would would you wear a gluttony patch if I asked you to, <laughs> and say you know put Big Macs all over yourself? I, I, I don't you have the right to be like, hey man, I don't have a problem with that. I know a lot of people that don't have a problem with McDonald's, but they just don't eat it and they don't put McDonald's patches on their work uniforms or whatever. They don't like fast food, that's perfectly fine. These guys have well, a right to be like, hey man, I don't have a problem with gay people, but I'm not gonna cape up for them. Well, first of all, good afternoon, Jason and Shamika. I wanna make this point. You didn't even put up the most eye-opening thing she tweeted yesterday which was uh, put up by Bobby Burak, your old colleague over there at OutKick, where she basically tried to make a comparison between young kids in drag being uh, paraded out there and an adult cheerleader, I believe, for the Dallas Cowboys, as if age and consent and maturity doesn't matter. Uh, Sir R. Kelly Spain, uh, I would have kept that tweet on the down low. But, you know, that, that's the whole thing, though. I, I, I believe... <laughs> that this whole movement, the LGBTQIA, has become a religion within itself. I think it goes far beyond just uh, a sexual identity or a gender identity. And, and just think about this. Let's say, and this would never happen in modern day America, there was a Christianity month. And if you asked a group of players who were either Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu to wear a cross, if any of those players said, you know what, that's not my religion, I'd rather just respectfully sit out, People would, I believe, nowadays would say, you know what, we will respect your wishes and you don't have to even participate, but we understand. They certainly would not be branded as bigots or prejudiced or racist. The last point I want to make on this, the very same people excoriating the Tampa Bay Rays players for making their stand were probably in mass absolutely screaming from the top of their lungs that men like Colin Kaepernick had the right to protest and take a knee. Well, if this is their version of taking a knee, why don't they have the ability to then exercise their First Amendment rights? I don't even think they understand their own hypocrisy here. You made some excellent points. I'm going to start with the one about uh, religious differences. And there are a lot of people that don't participate in Christmas activities. Right. And no one has a problem with them. And, you know, no, no one thinks they're weird. No one thinks uh, that, that they've done something wrong. We have that right. And so I, I just want to say that. But, but you're also right. And I, 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 I want to get Shamika's take on this. I did see the analogy of drag queens dancing for mm. kids and her saying that, oh, this is no different than NFL cheerleaders. <laughs> and, and you know, kids go to football games and they see the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders dancing or cheerleaders dancing. And by the way, we're, we're soon going to be seeing with the Carolina Panthers a transgender cheerleader a, a, as well. And this is progress in the NFL. But I, I don't What's the I, I don't understand the analogy between Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders at a football game, and I know they're <laughs> provocatively dressed, but the kids aren't tucking dollars. They're not, they're 100 feet, I don't know, 300 feet, depending on where your seats are, away from the cheerleaders, as opposed to, to drag queens. And, Help me help me make it make sense. It doesn't make sense. There is nothing that we can say to actually make her analogy make sense. And when I read what you called a, a word salad, I was so upset. It made me think that I wish a man in 1848 would have stood up to his wife when she said, I'm going to Seneca Falls. I wish he would have said, no, you're going to sit right here. You're not going to say a word. As a matter of fact, you're going to get in this kitchen and make me a sandwich because that's when it all started. And I wish he would have stood up to her. Then we wouldn't be hearing women spout this foolishness today. 
And when she called them bigots, Jason, I think that was the part for me that made me the most angry because part of the definition for a bigot is to be unreasonably attached to a belief. So you're going to say that someone who professes Christ is unreasonably, unreasonably attached to a belief. Someone who believed that Jesus died on the cross, rose on the third day, ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the father. From thence he shall come to judge both the quick and the dead is unreasonably attached. I think taking the rainbow and perverting it, something that was meant to be a covenant between God and his people, that he would never flood the earth again, perverting that, I think that's an unreasonable attachment to a belief. But I don't go around snatching down rainbows or, you know, I let them do what they do. And I don't call them bigots because I disagree with what they believe. So I just felt like that was an attack against Christianity and I didn't appreciate it. That part, calling them out like that made me angry. And, and so Steve, piggybacking off of Shamika in this entire conversation and, and even bringing the whole, the Matt Walsh conversation into it and what is a woman documentary and Matt has tweeted about how most of the media won't engage with him, won't review his documentary. This goes back to, to what I've been saying uh, the past 18 months to two years, is that the left seems to have a hard time defending its positions. And nothing is harder to defend than this whole gender issue that they've drummed up. And so the strategy is to not engage. And you can see it in all walks of life in terms of they, 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 instead of CNN or MSNBC having a guest on that will passionately and logically defend the Second Amendment, they'll just bring on people who take a dump on it and, and pretend like there isn't another side to the argument or just mock the other side of the argument amongst a little small group of themselves. And, and so I, I've been saying the reason they've adopted this strategy, block and charge, is because they can't defend their positions and they know it. So they've stuck fingers in their ears and closed their eyes and just shout to the top of their lungs. Well, Jason, you know what Matt Walsh should do and the producers? They ought to take all of those emails and actually print it up in bold letters and use it on the movie poster. I don't think there's a greater endorsement of that production than those missives. Those are actually better than four-star reviews. It's like, wait a minute, that person said this about that? I, I want to go see it even more. And, and the other thing is, I think this is really not just an attack on Christianity. I think it's an attack on common sense. Uh, just think about the, the conflating of the word or how they're distorting the word bigot. If you were a parent, and, and, and I don't mean CRT, but if you were a parent that didn't want your children to go to, let's say, a civil rights museum or something honoring Dr. Martin Luther King or anything that really happened in the 60s in an educationally honest way, I would be like, why, why, why wouldn't you want your kid to do that? Why, why wouldn't you want to send your children to actually see the American history of how we were shaped? But if a parent... And so you can say, all right, well, they're, they're bigots. But if a parent then says, well, that drag show where there's going to be eight-year-old kids twerking and working a pole, and uh, you're going to be putting dollar bills into uh, RuPaul's cousin's uh, <laughs> bikini, yeah, I'm, I'm good with that. Well, you're a bigot. Well, wait a minute. really, Is it really the same thing? That's where I think that Her uh, Sarah House of Spain really lost me. And, and the reaction that she got Look, as someone that has blocked more people than Orlando Pace and Anthony Munoz, myself, uh, what did she expect? And another thing I want to point out, I have to give Tony Reale credit because he pushed back as much as he could. I agree with you, Jason, but I will say this. As someone that was at ESPN and I was there a little bit longer than you, I wasn't as high up on the totem pole, but I was right there during the epicenter of 2020 when everything went haywire. I know for a fact, given my own experiences, that if you had a dissenting opinion on such issues as the LGBTQ, Black Lives Matter, or anything else, or white supremacy, 
you were not even allowed to retweet anything in opposition of it. You weren't allowed to retweet anything that supported your particular view because you'd be asked to take that down. And you certainly could not come on a show of that nature, like around the horn, and actually espouse those views. That's the reality of what's going on right now at the Disney run ESPN. All right, let me take care of some business. Uh, this is not a commercial. This is not another endorsement. This is life or death. I'm Jason Whitlock and here at The Blaze, we're building a village of Blaze babies with the goal of rescuing 50,000 babies from abortion. Let me tell you a little bit about Preborn and how they have rescued over 188,000 babies' lives. When a woman under the pressure to abort her baby meets that baby and hears the precious heartbeat, it's a game changer because 80% of the time she will choose life. Preborn clinics are located in the highest abortion areas in the country, standing strong for mothers in crisis and introducing them to the beautiful life growing inside of them. Would you join us in rescuing preborn babies? It's one of the most important things you can do, helping to preserve these precious lives. One ultrasound is just $28, or you can sponsor five ultrasounds for $140 and save five babies' lives. All gifts are tax deductible. To donate securely, call pound 250 and say the keyword baby. That's pound 250, keyword baby, or go to preborn.com slash fearless. That's preborn.com slash fearless. Let's do it. Let's save babies' lives. Let's, uh, after taking care of that business, uh, Steve, I'm gonna bring you back and uh, move on to some other topics in the sports world. Uh, Steve, I don't know if you saw this. Well, I know you saw it because you see everything. Steve Kerr, your man Steve oh. Kerr, and uh, Emi Aduko of the uh, Boston Celtics, uh, they led their teams in wearing T-shirts that said, end gun violence. And from what I understand, uh, when people saw those T-shirts uh, in game two, uh, man, just people all over the country just threw their guns away. Uh, the Crips <laughs> and the Bloods uh, brought out a peace pipe and sat down and just ended their feud. Uh, People on the south side of Chicago, west side of Chicago, just, you know, what do we got these guys? What are we shooting each other for? Didn't you see those T-shirts? Uh, the problem's fixed. The, the, these T-shirts have done it. And so I just want to give you the opportunity uh, to celebrate the Celtics and the Warriors for ending gun violence. Yeah, even the Hatfields and McCoys put away their uh, rifles. Here's the thing that really bothers me about Steve Kerr doing this it is such virtue signaling and i was on a chat sunday night hosted by Ock nation and we had a discussion over this on that very same weekend there was a huge gathering that turned violent in philadelphia something that happens not every day but happens often and this point was brought up by all of us because because again is this about all gun violence or just certain gun violence that could be politicized but look at the landscape of America and you look at the actual crime rates and the murder rates uh, that are at the hands of guns, most of them which are often illegal. And as Mash Ture explained to you a couple days ago, a lot of these cities that have these high homicide rates with guns are actually gun free zones in theory. But look at Philadelphia. They have an NBA team, the Baltimore, D.C. area. They have an NBA team, Los Angeles. We have two L.A. NBA franchises out here, Memphis has an NBA franchise. New Orleans has an NBA franchise. Minnesota has an NBA franchise. They all have various rates of homicide, violent crimes with guns. Would Steve Kerr ever go into those cities with the shirt saying, guys, we gotta end this gun violence, you know, self-destruction, we're headed for self-destruction. Let's just turn in our firearms, let's sing Kumbaya. Oh, what's that other song? We're all in the same gang. He wouldn't do it. This is just grandstanding. It is typical Steve Kerr. Um, I, I don't know what else to say other than the fact that it's an empty gesture. This is basically the newish hashtag that he's wearing for about a week. I, I well, I, I actually think they're gonna wear it longer mm -hmm. than a week because th this whole gun violence thing is the new COVID. 
is the new Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the new thing the media is going to focus on and, and spotlight. And so anytime they can, and again, I'm not even saying they should ignore it. I'm not, when 21 people get killed and Uvalde text, of course, it's a major story. But now the media is going out of its way to folk, and, and they all just want to, most of them all want to just point, uh, uh, point to the same problem. It's mm -hmm. the guns. <clears throat> right. It never, it's never culture. It's never gangs. It's, and that's, that's what I'm looking at these guys, in gun violence. How about in gang culture? Right. H how about in uh, uh, the violent culture that solves all conflicts with more violence? It, 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 and again, particularly for these black NBA players that love to pretend like professional athletes love to pretend like they're from the streets. Right. They know what's going on in the communities where they say they're from. Mm -hmm. uh, and they know it, gun, they're not sitting around going, oh, there's a gun. Let me run. They're saying, oh, there's a uh, baby and he's a member of the Crips and let me run because this dude is crazy. Never talk about it. All these big masculine athletic men that are so bold, they, again, they want to talk about things that can't talk back and, may, and will never show up on their door. Right, and that bothers me so much. I'm starting to wish the NBA stood for <clears throat> no bitch assness because <laughs> oh, it oh, appears oh. that they are just a bunch of puppets and they have, the Democrats have their hand up there behind and just animating them. Whenever they have something that they want to do, that's when the NBA stands up. And it really irritates me, like you said, because these are black athletes. You know what is happening in inner cities, in the black communities. I've never seen them speak out mostly on any topic until the media says, this is the topic of the time. This is when you say something. Now that the Democrats are on this big gun grab, now we want to talk about gun violence. When we've had people dying in our communities for, for years and they haven't pushed this, and so that really irritates me and I'm sick of them just being puppets for the Democrat Party. I, I'm gonna hammer the point uh, and I want to be careful because, you know, I, I've long been known as a critic of Serena Williams. Mm -hmm. Serena and Venus put out that movie King Richard about their father and I'm very reluctant to criticize him now because it's one of the greatest movies I ever saw. And it, it just, I love Venus and Serena and the way they represented their dad. But, I, and again, so this is just, I want to put the criticism in context. Love them because of the movie. Really love Venus. Uh, and don't have anything really negative to say. But what I would like to say is like, Serena represents a problem I have with these athletes in terms of, she had a sister killed by gang violence mm. and will never talk on it, right. never touch on it. Ne should be the leader of like, coming from LA and coming from what she experienced, as what her dad experienced, they showed you in the movie. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, we need to stop gun violence. We need to stop, I mean, a gang violence. Right. Should be, but, but we instead have gone the other direction and again, I'm trying, it's just like when she crip walked at Wimbledon. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, <laughs> you got a sister killed by gang violence and you crip walking at, at Wimbledon. And then every, and so let me leave the Williams sisters out of it because there's a lot of professional athletes, particularly black ones in football and basketball that love to talk about, oh man, my boy from high school, my cousin, Ray Ray, they all, they got shot up and killed and I saw this and I grew up in this name. But never, never once just come out and say, hey look, we have a gang culture problem. Mm -hmm. It's celebrated in music. Uh, it's why, here's one of the things, this is just, it's easy for me to say now I'm 55 and I'm old. But when I was younger and used to go to clubs, I was so bothered by the fact that like, man, anytime we go to a club, a black one, mm -hmm. we got to go through a metal detector. Mm -hmm. We got to get patted down to make sure we're not bringing guns in here. And then if you went to a predominantly white club, 
You didn't have to go through a metal detector. You didn't have to go through uh, getting patted down. And, and I was just like, you can't just say that, oh, that's because that's in a poor area. Right. It, it, it's in a poor culture area, mm -hmm. a culture that has been broken down. But I'm sorry, I've been poor. Right. It didn't make me want to grab a gun. It didn't make me want to join a gang. Mm -hmm. It didn't, you know, and, and so I, I just, the athlete's lack of willingness to address what is really going on and get caught up in this social media virtue signaling drives me crazy. And these well, t-shirts are another example. Go ahead, Steve. Jason, can I make a point here? Yeah, look, they're from the streets, but now they live in a gated suburb. That is the reality. That is part of the American dream that they are exercising, which is certainly fine. But, you know, it's interesting. You talk about gun violence. One of Draymond Green's closest teammates at Michigan State, a young man by the name of Adrian Payne, had a short stint in the NBA, was killed. There hasn't been that much coverage of it. We talked about it a couple weeks ago. Uh, I found it interesting that during the playoffs when the Miami Heat were still in it, they put up this public service announcement about Uvalde and let's stop gun violence, this and this. Meanwhile, for the death of a former NBA player, I, I maybe I don't follow these guys. Maybe I don't follow the league closely, which I certainly don't. Has there been that much outrage over his murder? There really hasn't been. And look, anytime, and these are what they call context clues. Anytime you hear the phrase, senseless violence, shots ring out, you know for a fact, well, they're not going to politicize that one. Those are very coded phrases that tell you exactly what happened and who was involved. Also, it bothers me when they say things like, we don't uh, have to speak out that much um, on violence in the community because those people get arrested and go to prison. That is not always true. When it no, comes it's a to lie. yes, it's when a it lie. comes to gang violence, they will kill one side, you know, kill somebody from one side. Nobody speaks out because snitches get stitches. Then they retaliate. Th those are a lot of deaths that go unsolved and they wreak havoc in these communities and nobody has to pay for it. So this lie that oh we only speak out when it's like a a white person that does it because they we, we want to make sure they're charged make sure the people in your neighborhoods are paying for what's happening I, I, I'm gonna have to double check myself I'm gonna say this and I'm not I've read it previously but I don't I could be I thought I read that 80% of murders in Detroit go unsolved mm. Mm -hmm. and the, the clearance rate on murder in all of these major cities hovers mostly around 50 percent wow and and so that's just a lie that you know oh yeah the guys that do x y and z they all go to jail it's the Derek chauvins that get away it's a lie mm -hmm. and it, it but it, again it's why they don't debate this stuff they talk in groups amongst themselves where there's agreement and everyone's agreed on the lie uh i want to move on to one more topic that i i think both of you all will find interesting. Uh, David Weigel, I believe is the name, uh, a, a political reporter for the Washington Post. He's been suspended for a month without pay for retweeting a joke that, and I wanna read the joke, uh, a YouTuber said, tweeted out, the guy, YouTuber's name is Cam Harless, Every girl is bi, you just have to figure out if it's polar or sexual. That's <laughs> the tweet. The guy from the Washington Post retweeted it. They've suspended him for a month without pay. A month without pay is pro what, 8% of his salary? Uh, yeah. uh, you know, close to 10% of his salary? It's and, and there's a female reporter, uh, I believe her name's F Felicia San Samez. She drove all of this. She started going after her, and she works at the Washington Post as well. She started going after this guy and pushed this issue and blew it up into more than what it was. 
Look, I know I'm the last guy, you know, my tweeting history with Jeremy Lin and I don't have an appropriate <laughs> filter for, for jokes and things like that, but a month without pay for a joke he didn't crack and retweeting it, her, her argument, the woman that pushed this is that it's something that, what did she say that about, it creates an environment it's a confusing message about what the post values are and that women will see this this whole thing that women are locked to Twitter and and based on who tweets out what is how women all across the world in D.C. feel about themselves and about the Washington Post because one guy retweeted someone else's joke. That's making women all over. Oh. Washington Post, terrible place to work. The Washington Post has the wrong values. We got to sit this dude. We got to deny this guy pay for a month. Uh, <laughs> Jason, couple points well, here. Number one. Oh, oh, oh. yeah, Go ahead, Jason, Steve. First, yeah, first of all, that was a fine joke. I personally thought it was humorous. But this, if I was the editor, I would have said, bye, Felicia. And I would have told Dave, Dave, you're a white guy. Let's be careful here. We kind of know the uh, atmosphere of today. But think about this on a more serious note about the Washington Post. They are taking much harsher disciplinary action on that gentleman for retweeting one joke that is relatively harmless as opposed to Taylor Lorenz, who literally needs an editor before, during, and most alarming, after she publishes multiple lies. Think about it. Retweeting a joke gets you a month off without getting paid. Meanwhile, Taylor Lorenz, who you literally have to have a digital whiteout because she just flat out lies and just has factual errors in her stories, there's no punishment. That says all that tells you everything you need to know about the post. Well, we don't know about her sexual, but I would say from just the way she handled this, we I would go with the polar part because <laughs> it definitely seemed like she's a little emotionally unstable. She has sued the Washington yeah. Post previously. It, it, it got tossed, but she said that her editors had mistreated and discriminated against her uh, because mm. they wouldn't let her uh, cover sexual harassment issues because she had been so public in her complaints about being sexually assaulted. They felt like she would, couldn't be objective and they wanted to leave her out of the coverage of Brett Kavanaugh and other things. And so she sued the Post, said that that was a discriminatory, poli discriminatory policy and cost her money and it got thrown out or whatever. But yeah, she's a little bit unstable in, in my view. All right. <laughs> Uh, let's let's move to uh, back to Sarah Spain. And let's get an approval rating. All right, uh, Sarah Spain here. This will be interesting if any of us uh, break out of the 30s uh, or even the 20s here. Sarah Spain, job performance. She's an opinionist uh, for ESPN. Uh, she's a panelist on uh, Around the Horn and appears on, I think, maybe a couple of podcasts or no, she's got a radio show, Spain and somebody else on ESPN as well. Uh, I'm going to give her a five in job performance just because, you know, she's kept a job at ESPN for a long time and she's got a radio show. She's on Around the Horn. You know, she's putting a little work in. So I'll give her a five in job performance. Uh, Shamika. I gave her a zero because <laughs> what these men do on the baseball field, I don't even understand why it concerns her. So I gave her a zero. I thought that was none of her business, and that's what mm, she gets. Zero. Me. All right, uh, Steve. Well, I think Shamika's being a little bit harsh. I gave her a one. Uh, she just, you know, <laughs> she's okay. She's crafted her career at ESPN, but she, you know, most of these ESPN personalities nowadays, as compared to the 90s, I think me and you have talked about it. Uh, if they were Baskin Robbins, it'd be 31 scoops of vanilla. They, they all just kind of blend in. They, they don't, none of them stand out. So I just give her a one. Mm. Uh, character and, uh, you know, 
I think she, I'm going to steal a line from uh, Jimmy. I think she's quite the character. Uh, and look, I think for her set of beliefs, she has a little character for her set of beliefs. And so I'll give her a six in character. And uh, Steve, I'm going to let you follow in after me. To, what your, your thoughts on character? You know, the character thing is interesting. I remember several months back uh, when Aaron Rodgers talked about being immunized and Sarah Spain went on this rant about how dishonest he was. He was putting people in danger, that how could he do this? And she literally like had this vitriol for Aaron Rodgers. And it was right around the same time Henry Ruggs unfortunately ended his career and altered several lives by killing someone with the DUI. And she had one tweet and she says, oh, that's awful. And I was like, what? Excuse me? So anyway, just for that, I'm going to give her a one. Mm. Uh, Shamika? I gave her a zero. Uh, because I did not like the fact that she called Christian men bigots. I, I didn't like that. So she gets a zero from me. Mm. So right now, if I do the math, carry the one right now on your screen. You have her at a zero, if I can, if my math is correct. Uh, authenticity, uh, you know, for her, and what she's doing, her job is to be woke on ESPN. I think she's, you know, as woke as woke can be and as authentic as woke can be. So I give her a two in authenticity. Uh, Steve? You know what? I, I kind of agree with you, except I'm going to give her a 20. She authentically believes what she spews every day. I give her credit. Look, I respect her right to have an opinion that is 180 degrees from you and I and Shamika, and she pushes it every day. She's made a nice living, and she authentically believes herself. So I got to give her a 20. I gave her a zero. <laughs> <laughs> I am fed up with women. I made a tweet yesterday that said if women hadn't spent the last 60 years trying to be men, we could have more uh, guarded what it means to be a woman. So any woman that is not guarding what it actually means, the fact that God created us for a certain purpose in this earth realm. If you are not guarding that, you're not authentic to me. Zero. Mm, 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 mm. Mm. So if I carry the one and put, if I keep, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Drop that zero. <laughs> uh, it factor. Uh, this is where I do think I got to give her some credit. I don't know if you guys know this or Steve, if you remember this, this may be news to you, but Sarah Spain's media career actually started when she auctioned herself off, uh, I think for Super Bowl tickets or World Series tickets or some sporting event, she auctioned herself off to men to take her to a sporting event. Mm. And so, and mm -hmm. at that time, you know, it was a pretty good auction because she's got quite a pair of cans that <laughs> attracted, you know, some <laughs> auctioners. <laughs> and so uh, I'm gonna give her an 11 in it factor because, you know, still got the cans and you know at one point you know she saw herself as a sex symbol worthy of being auctioned off hmm steve okay jason i'm surprised you didn't give her a 36d okay look look she's just another espn personality <laughs> that's kind of nameless and faceless with me uh she says some stuff once in a while that'll pop up on my timeline or, or bobby burak will write about her i gave her a five she is what she is she doesn't really move the needle for me one way or the other Mm. Uh, Shamika? I gave her a five because oh. that's the same score I would <laughs> give her on a scale of one to ten. And I only gave her a five because apparently somebody at ESPN thinks she's bangable and gave her a job. <laughs> But I Ooh. tend to lean with uh -oh. Sir Mix-a-Lot, even though she's heavy up top. Sir Mix-a-Lot said, my anaconda don't want none unless you got buns, hun. <laughs> I don't do the top heavy. She looks like a little linebacker to me. Her neck is kind of thick like a football oh player. God. Five. <laughs> wow. So she's got back. Huh. Wow. <laughs> I'm glad no, she said it, Jason, not us. I mean, she. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, she went with the rap reference. She, she stepped on your toe. She went with the rap <laughs> reference. You made one earlier. All right, so yeah. I've got Sarah Spain at a 24. Uh, Steve has her at a 27. 
Shamika, if I do the math here, zero plus zero plus zero plus five. You've got her at a five. We all have her at a dumpster fire. Uh, so that's it and that's all. Steve, uh, good job. Kept you longer than I expected. Uh, I got to keep it moving. Uh, Royce White. It's my obligation hate discrimination raising up your hands for freedom. All right, let's roll out to uh, Minneapolis and bring in Royce White, because uh, I want to continue our discussion of What is a Woman, the Matt Walsh documentary uh, on the transgender issue. We had a long conversation about it yesterday, and I figured uh, Royce would be a great way to get back at the topic. I know he would have something original to say. Uh, Royce, uh, welcome back to the show. Uh, my, my argument yesterday and, and remains that uh, I thought the, the documentary needed 10, 15 minutes of a biblical perspective to put it in proper context and, and kind of show what the whole transgender issue is, is really about, uh, about. But other than that, I really can't complain. I thought it was a compelling, entertaining, uh, important documentary. What was your take? Well, I mean, I, I, I think that the question of Christianity that you pose in your column is, is really the central or needs to be the central focus uh, uh, today in America. And, you know, there, there's so much talk about life, death, freedom, uh, humanity and government behind the scenes over on the Republican side. There is a a question about and and to what extent God is enumerated in the in the United States Constitution, and I think a better question and a much simpler question is, uh, would society benefit from more God or less God? And I think the obvious answer to that question is more God. Um, now, now I don't think that I talk a lot about national honor. I don't think that national honor uh, needs to be an absolutist view towards our founding fathers of the United States Constitution. It just can't be a nihilist view like the communists and globalists and Satanists want. Um, and and that's, that's largely what has been, you know, spread across society or America for the last 60 years is a nihilist view towards the ideas and values of America. And, and you know, it, in my opinion, I would say that the people on the right, the people who believe in America, the people who believe in God, the people who believe in tradition, the people who believe in conserving what is true and, and good, um, should should strive to clarify, have the moral clarity, uh, have the confidence to, to do what the Constitution was intended to do, and that's be a self-perfecting document. Uh, and, and I think that the perfection that can be had is to go back to God and, and, and institute more God. And so one of the arguments I've made yesterday and will continue to make today is that this, this belief that, uh, well, we got to get Republicans in power, that'll fix it. And, and I'm like, I'm not so sure. I, I don't believe that. I believe Christians and a biblical worldview needs to be placed back in power because politics force you to bend to whatever culture is in vogue at that time. And so I, I argued yesterday, and i say it again today, when Bill Maher pointed out that 20% of this latest generation of young people are identifying as LGBTQ, uh, and they're eventually they're gonna be a voting constituency, and Republicans are gonna lick their finger, put them in the air and say, whew, if there's far more LGBT people voting, then we need to make sure our policies and platform are in line with them. And, and so they're just gonna bend, and I think we already see it, you know, political people bending to that will or, or that wind. And so the only salvation are people of religious faith. Uh, it's, it's the only solution. And that's why, again, this is a spiritual problem uh, not a political problem. Yeah, I think one of the main problems, uh, one of the main 
uh, downfalls I've seen so far being involved in Republican politics is, you know, this misuse of the separation of church and state. And and the, the separation of church and state, in large part, is not seen through the proper historical context. Um, the historical context is that if there is one complaint, if there is one flaw, fatal flaw, you could argue, in the United States Constitution or our founding documents, it's that our founding fathers, um, you know, exhibited moral fatigue and not being more explicit about God's centrality in the ideas. And and obviously the historical pressure that that they were under at the time is is well documented uh, as well, uh, you know, having having just experienced a tyrannical king, a monarch, um, and and who who had used not only his political power but but tied to a, a tyrannical Anglican church, um, that was most of the reason why they didn't or why they weren't more explicit in, in discussing God or or making God a central theme, and that that moral fatigue, that gap of moral fatigue, left the door cracked for moral hazard to to build from then till now and and satan has walked right through that sliver and crack in the door and so you know all of these all of these historical questions now ex post facto are used often to justify that we should throw the constitution out or we should bend the need to amendments of the constitution and the republicans you know capitulate to that in many ways as well you see that in the gun debate where you know you have republican senators or people who are more moderate say oh well you know we should keep our ar-15s because they're the best way to hunt a raccoon it's like no we need our AR-15s because radical left tyranny and authoritarianism is on the move. And that's a much more sound reason and more constitutional basis for the right to bear arms. So, you know, there's a huge, huge Republican capitulation to uh, the attack on, on America's foundation. Look, Royce, I think one thing that people have misconstrued about the founding documents and the founding fathers is that and it's clear as day, I need to do some more research on this, but to me it's clear as day, everything that they did was trying to protect the people from the government. And so this whole separation of church and state, people have misconstrued it as like protecting the government from the church. And they were actually trying to protect the church from the government. And that's why, that's what that is actually about. And if you just, everything, all the systems and the, the, the they put in place and the words were about, and why, again, they want you to have the right to bear arms is because they know the danger of the government and they want you at all times to be able to protect yourself and protect these religious institutions from the government. Yeah, self-governance. I mean, self-governance being the key to freedom is is the central idea, and and that your freedom is ultimately God-given. And and I mean, I, I think that is that is pretty clear in the founding documents and even in the Constitution. But but again, the founding fathers uh, having having capitulated to the political pressures of their time and not mentioning God in an explicit way has great great uh, consequence, you know, that we see playing out today. And and really, you know, most of these people who argue against the Constitution or that America is just a, a symbol of white supremacy or, or whatever other argument they make, they, they often reference the fear of going or becoming subject to a theocracy uh, and, and that the right wing or the conservatives or the Christians in this country just want a theocracy. You hear the Young Turks, they mention that, or, you know, people on the far left, AOC, Ilhan Omar, my opponent, oh, we, we can't have a theocracy. But in all actuality, this country has become an anti-God theocracy. We've become a theocracy of scientism. And that that can be said on the global scale as well. And there is nowhere in history where theocracy has yielded the type of chaos, violence, and murder 
that this scientific anti-God theocracy has. I don't care if you talk about the Inquisition, the Crusades, any of the the genocides or or wars in the Middle Age. None of them have had uh, the chaos and death toll of the anti-God theocracies. And I count uh, Nazi Germany as an anti-God theocracy. I count Stalinist Russia as an anti-God theocracy. I count Mao China as an anti-God theocracy. And and ultimately, I I count the, the 40 to 50 million million abortions per year as the product of a scientific anti-God theocracy. And again, if we have no sanctity of life, uh, then, then we can't have any any real concept or, or uh, adherence to an idea of human rights. Hey, I want to move you on to a slightly lighter topic, just slightly okay. lighter. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sarah Spain, ESPN, calling Tampa Ray, Tampa Tampa Bay Rays baseball players uh, bigots because they would not wear uh, gay pride patches on their uniform. Uh, Your thoughts? Yeah, well, I'm a bigot then. I'm not wearing any gay pride patches in in any in any regard. You know, I'm from the Twin Cities and we have one of the biggest LGBTQ citizen, you know, uh, Uh, communities in the entire country. I think statistically it's like San Francisco and then Minneapolis. And so I grew up around plenty of people who are LGBTQ. Um, This isn't a question of whether or not the LGBTQ community has faced any persecution in the past, because we know that they have. But many groups have faced persecution. This isn't a question about LGBTQ citizens and should they have American rights, rights as American citizens. This is a question of should the LGBTQ be the central focus of all of our political attention and all of our political, uh, um, um, you know, uh, you know, all of our political emphasis, you know, and, and my answer, and I think even some people who are in the LGBTQ who are honest will say, no, no, this thing is getting out of hand. And I'm actually starting to get feedback now that I'm campaigning on the ground from people who are LGBTQ, who think that the political powers that be are, are using the LGBTQ circumstance to push a political agenda. And, and I would tend to agree that the Democrat platform is exploiting the LGBTQ, actually. They're using the LGBTQ as a human shield to say, here is this marginalized group of people who you can't really identify or pin down as a demographic, and we can use them as the ultimate uh, uh, scapegoat or or leverage to push any policies that we want. Uh, And and most of them end up being anti-God in in nature. So, um, you know, do I support the LGBTQ having rights? Yeah, I think those rights are codified in the American United States Constitution. Uh, all of these these ploys to use the LGBTQ to destroy the Constitution or go and get further rights, like having a gay nightclub here in Duluth, Minnesota, and, and having young grade school kids brought to a gay nightclub for a, a drag stripper show and and have white liberal moms hand out one dollar bills or or money for the kids to hand to a drag queen stripper is way beyond the scope of a basic fight for lgbtq rights and anybody who doesn't understand that or can't admit that they're in on it number one and they're they're kind of outing themselves as satanists because that's satanic totally agree i i think for me I've seen it coming. I, I've been saying it for 10 years, and I, I saw it just in popular culture, just in the TV shows that I was watching. It's like you couldn't watch a TV show that that storyline was not injected into, into it. Even, I'm re-watching The Sopranos right now, and where it went from season one to in season five or six where they pivot, to the fat dude, Vito, uh, being Johnny Cakes and being gay. There's no signs of that. Like in season four or five, uh, he's trying to get with Christopher's girlfriend, Adriana. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden on a dime, an edict came down from Hollywood. Hey, the LGBT has to be in all these storylines. Next thing you know, the fat Vito, he's gay. He's at gay nightclubs. He's run off and blah, blah, blah. And, and just in every show, it's like that narrative that has to be placed there. And so, look, pop culture, 
uh, actually is, is like how you foreshadow what's gonna go on in the rest of culture. And so I'm not surprised that all of our attention is, is focused on 5%. 5% of the population gets 70% of the conversation. Not surprising to me. Right. It's like an overcorrection. I think the same thing happened with women's rights. Like, of course, nobody wanted women to be to be beat and they wanted them to have a voice. But then feminism came and it was a overcorrection. And I think that's the same thing that's happened. You know, of course, like Roy said, there are some, you know, gay people who have been oppressed. But what we're doing now to me is an overcorrection. And I'm doing self-reflection as I listen to you two talk. And I'm trying to figure out where I have been and, and not really stood my ground in certain areas. And today going forward, I'm, only, I'm not saying all those alphabets. I'm going to say maybe the L and the G, because if you B, you still L or G, and if you T, you not real. <laughs> so I'm, that's going to be my step to, to stop bending over for them. L, L and G, that's all you're getting from me. <laughs> Royce, I'll, I'll give you a final thought here, and then we'll let you go. Yeah, well, I think that the telltale sign of the contradiction in the entire LGBTQ plus movement argument, uh, push for policy, push for influence on on federal funding and, and policy is uniquely tied to the, the gun debate or the separation of church and state. Because fundamentally, if you're going to argue that that, let's say, violent video games have an impact culturally on young people's minds psychologically, that could precursor them being violent in the future as adults or as as teenagers. Or if you're going to say that um, the public schools uh, allowing God to be in in the public schools uh, creates the, the circumstance for bigoted religious views, then the same thing surely could be said of, of putting LGBTQ plus culture in the schools for young people. Right. I mean, I, I don't even get where that that hypocrisy is allowed to be uh, promoted through the mainstream. If if God can't be in our public schools because it's too uh, um, harmful or influential or impactful on a young person's mind and they should have that choice, then then the same should definitely be true of the LGBTQ and, and, and their beliefs and ideologies. But they make the claim that, and, and I've said this before, that the scientific method is one of the four heresies of the West. They make the claim that that being gay or lesbian or, or whatever else is is a natural thing and that it's not cultural. Mm -hmm. So the left view of, of the world mostly is that anything we don't believe in is a is a social construct. Anything that we do believe in is the natural order. Uh, the problem is they have the natural order completely uh, backwards. Mm, uh, great stuff. Thank you, Royce. Shamika, I want to make a, a final point uh, w with you is when I think about the, the overcorrection deal and, and I start thinking about pop culture and the messaging in all the movies and TV shows, the other thing that really I struggle with uh, is for every story that involves black people mm -hmm. on TV, movies, or whatever, it seems like it just goes overboard on the race angle. Mm. Like, our whole existence is built around our interaction with white people, mm -hmm. and our, our negative interaction with white people, and that, uh, that our whole lives are defined by racism. Right. And I'm just, I'm 55. And I've engaged with a lot of white people through athletics, through going to school, work environment, whatever. My engagement with them doesn't define my life. Right. It, it, it's, there have been occasional issues, but for the, if, if someone went and examined my life, it just hasn't been built around racism or right. my experiences with racism. And that's like, I, I'll see people say, oh, God, I had this horrible experience with police. <laughs> and, and it was so racist and blah, blah. As if this was a day-to-day -day thing they were dealing with and as if they only had one experience with police. Because again, I've said it many times, I'm a speeder. I've had 
30, 40 engagements with police pulling me over in my lifetime. I've had one bad experience. Right. And so that one, and it was bad, and I didn't like it or whatever. But what about the other 30? Right. And then and that's them pulling me over. And then I got friends that are police officers. I just, I run into police officers at, while I'm out socializing. I, so I've had thousands of engagement with police, virtually none of them negative, but every movie or every TV show that we have some kind of major role in, it, it, it makes us believe that our whole life is built around our interactions with white people and it's just not true. That's not true. And another thing that bothers me is that how black people feel like you're supposed to have some type of alliance simply based on race or any other person simply based on race that bothers me. And like, let, let me let me say this. I, I, I get your point, but I almost understand that based on history, based on look when they got signs up, say black people can't drink in this water fountain can't shop in this store, blah, blah. That history built an alliance. Slavery built an alliance among black people. But, but what, what I don't like is that, we're, that the real alliance that we have isn't really about skin color, mm -hmm. it's about oppression. Mm -hmm. That's our alliance and that's why we're all looking for examples you know, what ties us together. You had a bad experience with police too, didn't you? Why, you can't, you don't like white people either, do you? Right. White people don't like you either. That's the alliance. It's really not skin color at this point. And again, that's why you'll take, LeBron James is a billionaire, but he went out of his way to uh, come up with some story that he faced racial discrimination so that he could feel more black and connected to other black people. Again, that's what I find preposterous, the fact that a police, because if our, I guarantee you, Christian, he's young, uh, one of our producers, but at some point he's going to have a bad experience with police, because mm -hmm. police are kind of jerks and they got tough jobs and blah, blah, blah. But no one expects me and Christian to connect over, oh, we both had bad experience with police. But mm -hmm. black people, that's our connection. Oh yeah. my God, a white person said something rude to me. That I experienced some sort of microaggression. That's our, again, our connection isn't based on us, it's based on white people. White people are what tie us together. That's crazy. Yeah, I, I just don't like for people to make me feel like I have to connect with them based on anything they say, whether it's race or uh, because I'm a woman. I remember when people didn't vote for Hillary and Michelle Obama told us as black women, like we really need to take a second look at ourselves if we didn't vote for her as women. I don't have to agree with someone just on surface things that we may have in common. I don't like that. If I see a black woman in the dollar store in pajama bottoms and a bonnet and she's cursing her son out because he wanted a pack of annihilators and she's telling him he ain't shit or he's gonna be just like his daddy, I am not going to form an alliance with her simply because she's a black woman. I'm gonna call her out on her BS because I should. And I'm gonna turn my nose up to her just like the black man that left her. Mm. All right, get your Fearless <laughs> Army swag at shopblazemedia.com backslash fearless. Larry Taunton, next. All right, welcome back. Uh, we're gonna bring in a friend of the show, Larry Taunton. Uh, you guys know him as an author, a columnist, public intellectual. Uh, Larry wrote something on Twitter a few days ago that caught my attention. Uh, it was a long Twitter thread about guns and mass killings. I think it was 14 tweets. All of it very interesting. It started with the fact that Larry's visited the site of some of the most notorious mass killings in modern history. And it goes on to basically explain why disarming uh, the American people is not the solution. Uh, he gets at some of the themes I've talked about today and previously on the show 
that I think many Americans don't understand that the government actually is the biggest perpetrator of mass disasters of any kind, mass murders, exploitation, oppression, and blah, blah, blah. And, and that's why the founders, again, as I said earlier to Royce, wanted us armed and able to protect ourselves from a government that will turn tyrannical, tyrannical if we aren't armed and protected. But enough already, I'm gonna let Larry explain what he was trying to convey, he's, he's the expert. Larry, welcome back to the show. Uh, and if you could summarize what you were trying to accomplish in your 14 tweets. Yeah, it's great to be with you, Jason, uh, as always. You know, um, I am not usually the first uh, to chime in on, you know, breaking news. I prefer to, to sit back a little bit and think and to, to sift through um, all the details, often because the things we hear at the very beginning are, uh, are often false. But, um, you know, here we are a week or so out from uh, this, uh, this shooting in Texas. And I'm, I'm listening to what people are saying on this, and I, I find myself disagreeing with an awful lot of it. First of all, uh, several years ago, completely unrelated to this, Jason, uh, I visited the sites of numerous terrorist attacks uh, from, uh, you know, I was, I was at Ground Zero um, as a volunteer shortly after the attacks there when almost no one was a was allowed in uh, that part of Manhattan. But I was also visited, you know, the site of the Bataclan um, in, uh, in Paris, a short walk away, Charlie Hebdo, the attacks in London on Westminster Bridge, on at London Bridge, in Stockholm, where a truck was used as an, uh, for an attack, in Toulouse, in Nice, uh, in several places like this. And, um, you begin to see certain themes uh, begin to emerge. And um, I, I find that the Democrat response to this, Jason, is fairly predictable. It's, uh, it's, a, it's emotional, it's politicized. Uh, it is uh, to say we're gonna remove guns from everyone as though that's gonna solve the problem. And I think, in, for instance, in Nice, where 86 people were killed, uh, no guns were involved. It was just a truck that just, ran over all kinds of people. Same thing in Stockholm, same thing in London. Um, and then at the Bataclan um, and at Charlie Hebdo, law-abiding citizens were completely unarmed. Um, the attackers walked into a uh, heavy metal concert. They casually began shooting people like fish in a barrel. They knew those people were unarmed. They could reload at will and just keep shooting. And the police responses were quite slow. Yeah, and I'm wondering, Larry, what it's like when I read through your t tweets, it all makes sense, and, and, but one of the things that I think people don't understand is like governments and the atrocities that they execute. And it's like, why aren't we being taught this in school? Yeah. It, it's almost like we've been convinced that, oh, the government is your best friend and it's your next door neighbor who voted for Trump. That's the guy that'll kill you and will yeah. harm you. It's not the government. When, when the history of what governments have done and will do is so easily understood and explained, but we're just not teaching young people that. And that's why I think our conversations are so perverted and uninformed when things like events in Texas happen and we immediately go to, oh, we gotta take these guns away from people. I couldn't agree with you more, Jason. I mean, listen, the, the, the founding fathers of this country, they believed in checks and balances. We all, we all know that term when we, we think about the branches of government. But checks and balances in their minds went further than that. And one of the, the, the major checks and balances was that a populace would not be disarmed. I mean, these were people who did not trust government. They didn't trust that the government that they were founding wouldn't eventually become tyrannical. So one of the checks and balances that they put in there was the Second Amendment, because governments that are armed when their populations are unarmed, this is a central feature of tyranny. And, uh, and, and so, so governments are held in check, made more accountable by people who are 
armed. And I think that it's uh, it's noteworthy, for instance, this recent attack in uh, Charleston, West Virginia, where a guy shows up with an AR-15 at a graduation party. A woman shoots him dead. She's armed. She is exercising her conceal and carry rights properly. She's properly trained with that weapon. She pulls it out and shoots that guy dead before he can kill anyone. Same thing happened in Garland, Texas a few years ago. Uh, a couple of uh, Islamic terrorists show up an event. They, uh, they pull out their guns and people who are on site are armed and shoot them both dead before anyone can get killed. So um, I, I, think, I, I think we're having the wrong conversations. What, and, and I'm going to ask this question, it'll get me into trouble, but I'm going to ask. You does, America the- actually, yeah, does America actually have a mass shooting pandemic, one, and if it does, what are the proper solutions? Well, um, I, I think it's very interesting that the National Institute of Health has told us that we have seen a, uh, a tremendous spike in mass shootings during the pandemic. So um, these are pandemic shootings, you might say. Uh, why is that? Well, it seems that locking people down, um, isolating them, leads to some serious mental health issues, leads to a lot of anxiety, suicide rates have skyrocketed. And Jason, I think we're seeing young people like this shooter in Texas. Uh, these, these people, you know, more isolation, more lockdown leads to people spending more time on the internet. And guys like this shooter, they find the, uh, you know, the dark corners of the internet where these kinds of shootings are celebrated. I mean, if we see somebody, you know, uh, running onto a football field naked, the camera turns away. Uh, We don't give them the attention we want. We don't don't talk about them. Uh, These shooters are celebrated and they know this and they're looking for their Andy Warhol moment of um, of fame. And so I I think that we're seeing uh, um, a, a huge rise in these shootings as a result of lockdowns. Again, governments is a part of the problem here. I think it is as well, but I also think this, and we, because we were talking about this earlier in the show, social media and how it's disconnected us and how, you know, I wrote about this as it relates to the Uvalde situation, is kids that are engaging with people over DMs, over Instagram, or even text messaging, and they're not in school, or they're wearing masks. We, we all seem to be just moving further and further away from intimate connections with each other, and I don't mean that in a sexual way. I mean that in a way of just like, you really get to know people, and that's how you really get to uh, love and value other people's lives, is because you're genuinely connected to them, All of this social media and smartphone technology has disconnected humanity, and I think that's unhealthy. I I agree with you. And let's go back to your your earlier question, which I didn't quite answer in terms of what I think the real problems are here. You made what I thought was an excellent point in your article on what is a woman, and, and that is that that we have gotten so far away from our Judeo-Christian roots, from from any kind of basis in uh, in morality, that we now find ourselves in this absurd place. I mean, if if I may make a biblical reference, you know, Romans chapter one says that when you suppress the truth of God, you eventually pervert the truth, and you eventually pervert life itself. Meaning, you, you become untethered from reality, and you begin, which was partially your point in that article. Article, to where you have come to a place where you can say a man could be a woman and a woman could be a man, or what is a woman in the first place? Well, the left has, they have carried out an assault on two very important institutions that I think are leading to these attacks. One of them is you can't complain. I mean, you know, you're, you're running campaigns on defund the police, and then you turn around and you complain about where are the police 
when there's a when there's a mass shooting. So the, these this line of thinking is utterly contradictory. The second one is the left has carried out um, an, uh, a decades long assault on the Christian faith. And, you know, one might say it, it, it might be good to have a, you know, a placard in school that says thou shalt not kill. But no, you can't do that. That's that's, you know, a, a violation. You can't do that. So we, we are seeing, you know, a gay pride month that is being forced into every corner of, um, of our society. It is absolutely an assault on uh, on on our Christian values. And at the same time, we seem to be scratching our head and saying, gosh, Wonder what's happening in society that all these terrible things are happening. They're connected. They're definitely connected. And, and Royce likes to say this, who was on before you, and we certainly like to echo those thoughts in, in terms of the abortion issue. And, and this is about a mindset. And, and so you want a society that values life. And so how can your society value life when there's half of your population or the loudest part of your population values the ability and the freedom to kill babies in the womb, and then you wonder, if, if that's the mindset, if, if life has that little value that women and other supporters of, of, of that are, are like, this is a life or death issue, they're gonna draw a line in the sand over their right to kill a baby in the womb all the way up to the final trimester or, or the, the, until birth. No one, we got a polluted mindset. We don't value yeah, yeah. life and then we get upset when we see symptoms or examples of like, well, we don't value life. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's actually even worse than that, um, Jason. You know, there is a pending piece of legislation in California that would give mothers a right to euthanize um, their babies up to 28 days postpartum. So they would have the right to kill born children. So we are moving in the direction. This has been a philosophy of Princeton bioethicist Peter Singer, a guy that we've debated at our our organization. Um, Peter Singer is arguably the most influential bioethicist in the world. And it is his philosophy that is now actually finding its way into proposed legislation. So to your point, um, we, we do not value human life. And kids know this. They see, the, see straight through the hypocrisy of a culture that tells mothers that they can kill their children and then uh, acts with horror when there are mass shootings. They're one and the same thing. Larry, I, I need you to clarify or just say that just a bit more aggressively or, or something. <laughs> You're In California, Correct. they're trying to push a law that you can kill babies after they're born. Correct, up to 28 days. You've heard of this, Shamika? Yeah, I heard of that. I, I wasn't certain that it was true, but yes, I heard of it. And, and for me, listening to, to him, I have to agree and with you saying that we have really just, we don't connect with people anymore. I often wonder how women can even be so callous to have abortion after abortion. And how would you be able to kill your child up to 28 days after birth, after you've looked in the child's eyes and face and smelled the child? How could you do that? But I think we have been on such a course of teaching women to not be women that the they can be this heartless. We've, we've really fed them this whole idea that you, you don't have to value being married. You don't have to value having children when that is exactly what God created us for, which is why I said I have to agree with your stance on yesterday. We've gotten so far away from why we are even in this earth realm as women we can be heartless and cold like that because we are not even valuing our purpose to start with. And that's crazy to me that any woman could actually do that, but you're seeing women be so cold because we aren't being true to who we are by nature. 
Larry, I'm going to give you the final thought. I really appreciate you joining us from uh, South America. Uh, if you got a final thought, love to hear it. If not, we'll yeah, let you go. Uh, Jason, I, uh, I'm going to say what I, I, I think is, uh, is a thought and idea that we share. And uh, the answer here isn't disarming Americans. They'll find trucks. They'll find bombs. They'll, they'll find knives. Um, all kinds of ways that you can kill your fellow man. Um, the reality is that we, we greatly need a reawakening in this country of our spiritual values because we have lost any real sense of who we are. And until un, until that happens, this, this, if you want to put it this way, this pandemic of violence, of immorality, of perversion will just simply get worse. Larry, thank you so much. Appreciate the time. Uh, you topped off a great show for us. Uh, I think I hear tomorrow, or I'm gonna hear tomorrow, and that means we'll see you tomorrow. Waiting for the countdown, coming off the breakdown, standing in line for freedom. Looking for a breakout, feeling like a standoff, nothing in life like freedom. Came like a fighter, striking like a ladder, making all this moves for freedom. I want freedom. No negotiation, my sister, no relation We all just wanna have freedom Sitting on the corner, never been alone I'm breaking my back for freedom Bless, we are living, get back We are receiving, all deceiving We all wanna be free We want freedom I just want, I wanna be free